My friends, I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. For those of you who have perhaps come to know me well, know that I'm a terribly impatient person. In fact, Mervyn will often say to me, you got to slow down. You got to slow down. Much of my life is spent always dreaming and hoping for great things to happen. And in my mind, I begin to conceive of what those things are, and I put all my energy, all my effort into seeing those through. And then it seems just as when things are about right, the landscape completely changes. The conditions all change. Even our church, in the weeks leading up to the fire, I had such dreams and hopes of what God was going to do in this place. There was real excitement. I was even going to go over to England to meet with people to say, here's what we could possibly do here at St. Anne's. And then overnight, that all seemed to be taken away. In the immediate days after the fire, I felt this discouragement, and I remember lamenting to Father Jeff, the priest with the Orthodox community, that why I had such dreams, such hopes. Even Merv and I, we had such vision of what could possibly be. And I have to confess that part of me became angry with God. And the question that lingered in my mind was, why did you lead me to this place? Why did you show all these things that are going to work in this way only to let me down now? Why? What sort of God are you that leads us into this space only to seem to take away all that we hope and all that we desire and imagine? St. Anne, whose feast we celebrate this day, lived that sort of life. From what we are told, St. Anne longed and yearned to have a child. But after years and years of trying to conceive, she found herself barren. And this was such devastation to her, as you can imagine. The pain that she felt, the agony that she went through, because she was certain, she believed absolutely that God had destined her to have a child. Yet here she found herself completely barren. And to make matters worse, her husband divorces her, leaves her, and decides to go run off to a mountaintop to be on his own. Men, unfortunately, in the scriptures and in ancient times, don't seem to be terribly courageous. They're always running away. But Anne remained ever vigilant in her belief that God was going to do a good thing. And with time, she and her husband reunited. And in her very old age, in the late years of her life, we are told, she conceived a child. Not some ordinary child, but a child that would become the mother of Jesus. What Anne had envisioned was probably nothing like what came into being. Anne had envisioned having a child and that everything would work out in a particular way, but that's not how things happened. But in God's time, in God's vision, something greater took place. Something much more wondrous and something much more beautiful for creation. And I think it's a lesson for us. 
I don't know about you, if you do this as well, but I think we all put all our energy into what we believe ought to be the right way. That we devote so much time, so much anxiety, so much stress to seeing things happen in the way we believe them to happen. We try to control our world. We try to manipulate it in such a way that it serves the vision and purpose that we have. But there's two problems with that sort of way of life. On the one hand, we believe that we are the ones who form and fashion this world. We believe that we are entirely independent and we need no help. But the truth is, you and I do need the help of not only one another, but the very grace of God to do what we are about to do. And churches are particularly guilty of this, by the way. All these churches want to come up with these great business plans, all these visions, and say how God is going to work in their place. But the reality is, it's not going to work in that way. Look behind us. But that doesn't mean that God isn't with us. Quite the contrary. It doesn't mean that the dreams we had have been lost. Quite the contrary. No. What it means is that God is calling you and I into a deeper relationship of trust and confidence to know that God will do what God intends to do. And God's dream, God's vision for us is much greater than what you and I could ever imagine or hope for. It's much greater than what we could ever imagine or hope for. And this is the thing that I'm coming to see in my life. And it's an invitation that I offer to you today. I'm not trying to dismiss the pain and the suffering that we experience in this life. It's real. And you ought to feel the feelings that you have. And it's okay to say to God, I don't actually get what you're doing and I'm actually getting quite frustrated with you. Believe me, I've said that many times. I once sat it over at dinner table and my partner said, oh, how dare you do that with God? And I was like, well, God already knows what I'm thinking. It's not quite the revelation here. But God wants you and I to have that sort of relationship, but God also wants us to have the relationship of trust and the confidence that God's vision is much greater than our own. And that's what I think God is saying to us today. That's what God is saying to us today. That God's vision, God's dream, is much greater than what you and I could ever have. And we have to simply turn and trust depend, let God lead, and it may not happen in the same time frame that you and I would like it to happen. Sure, I would love to have a new church behind us built tomorrow, but that ain't going to happen, and that's not a bad thing. With time, grace is allowed to grow and to foster and be among us. This time now is just as critical of a moment as the day we consecrate a new church. In fact, this time is probably more important because as we sit in this liminal time, in this time of unknowing, this is where we allow God to enter into us. And this is where we learn how to trust that God has a vision greater than our own, much greater vision than our own. No strategic vision, no business plan will ever actually get a church anywhere if it does not depend upon the grace of God. And I think God is inviting us into that deeper relationship of trust
that we get up each day and say, Lord, show me the path. Show me the way that I'm to go. Not be the one to determine and say what that is. And that's hard work. Especially for somebody like me, a good German who likes to have everything planned in life. I really do. And it's tough sometimes. Because I, even Mervyn is giving that look. He knows this about me. <laughs> I caught that look there. Mervyn knows this because he's always tempering me and saying, now, now, Father, in time. I want to know the future. I want to know how the story ends. But that's not the point. The point is to live in this present and to entirely trust in the grace of God, to entirely depend upon the grace of God and turn to the grace of God to lead and guide us in this time and to be open that amazing things are going to be all in God's time, not our own. Anna is actually a good illustration of that. Anna, as you may know, never actually got to see Jesus. Legend tells us she died before Jesus was born. She got to see her daughter, but she never got to see what God did in her grandson's life. You and I may not see the fruit of our labors today, but they will be born in God's good time. We simply work with God here and now, now, here and now, knowing that what God intends will be. Amen.